Hello, and welcome to Rock, Paper, Swords, the historical action and adventure podcast. My name is Matthew Harfey. And my name is Stephen A. McKay. We're both best-selling historical fiction authors, and together we chat about all things historical and anything that could fall under the banner of action and adventure in books, film, TV, and games. Oh, and we also talk about rock music from time to time. Now, today will be a little bit different. For the first time in what seems like ages, we don't have a guest. It's just the two of us. I am, however, going to be interviewing Matthew, as he has a new book due out, and hopefully you're all desperate to know about it. So we'll just jump straight into the questions, Matthew, okay? Okay. Now, I was confused, which is easily done for me. So when you were talking about your new book, I assumed it was a Western, and I wrote out questions for that. But this is not the Western, though. This is A Day of Reckoning, book three in your A Time for Swords series. So what's it about? Well, um, yeah, see, I, it is inter- interesting that you were so easily confused first first off. Yeah. Um, and and it is an interesting thing as well for people to understand the ways no, I'm easily of publishing confused. in that you're, well, that you're easily confused, but that, that, that you're actually talking about the new book that's coming yeah. out when yeah. you're actually already writing or have finished the mm-hmm. next book because i've already finished the western that you mentioned so when we talk about that for actually coming out to the public that will be the summer you know next year probably and it'll be old by then to you <laughs> for me it will be it will already be old news yeah i'll have written another bear brand book by then but on to a day of reckoning so yes it's the third book in the hunlaf um series the a time for sword series and anyone who's read the book so far will know that it's written um, ostensibly by an aging monk um, this series and he's looking back on his life a monk called Hunlaf it's set at the very end of the 8th century the beginning of the Viking Age and he's looking back on a very storied um, and exciting life um, recounting the different adventures that he's had over the years because when he was a very young man in the first book he um, he witnesses the attack of the Vikings and the Norsemen on Lindisfarne in 793 and rather than get killed with the rest of the monks um, or run away he decides to stand and fight and from that moment his life is changed and he takes up the mantle of a warrior um, and ends up joining a motley crew or bringing together a motley crew of um, of different warriors and defending a monastery against against the invading vikings and the second book they voyage off over the seas um, and start uh, doing other quests and adventures. Um, and in this third book, the the ship that they're on, the Brimsteader, um, and this motley crew of warriors and people, um, have, have travelled down south further than Hunlaf, or most of them, if, if not all of them, any of them have ever been before, um, to the land of Al-Andalus, which is modern-day Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, and um, so it's his first contact with um, Arabs and Muslims, and um, yes, much uh, much adventure ensues as there's all sorts of intrigues going on, and people with different um, different reasons for travelling down there. Hunlaf is travelling looking for um, a, a book that appears in the very first book of, of the series that they've been he's been kind of chasing. Um, and he has reason to believe that it's gone down south to the kingdom of the Moors, as they are known in the book and at the time. Um, and um, there's other people on the ship with him that are travelling for different reasons, but I won't give too much away. Yeah, nice. I was just thinking as you were talking there, I have read the first book. But it's very similar to Cornwell's uh, King Arthur books, where he had a monk, didn't he? Uh, Derville. Who's telling the oh, story? Yes, yes you know? that's right. So that's uh, the yes, yeah. A similar idea, although I mean, you obviously know that he can't die, but uh, those are Cornwell's yeah. best books to me. So I thought it just goes to show that you can get away with it if, if you know how to do it, and you're obviously it's really doing interesting. It as well. well, thank you. It's really interesting. Yes, I mean, obviously, it's a bit of a nod to that. It's kind of a, a trope um, of of some types of historical fiction. You see it again and again. I mean the. Um, Obviously, you've got those Arthurian books by Bernard Corn, which are a huge inspiration, obviously. Um, but um, I think the the Outlaw series by um, Angus, Angus Donald yeah. again, they have that. It's um, Alan O'Dale looking back, um, I think, and writing sort of his memoirs. 
so it's a very sort of, and of course you've got the flashman books as well it's this 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 thing of sort of looking back on your life and and writing memoirs but um yeah but yeah it's um it was interesting talking to the last week i was recording the audio a bits of the audiobook and i did a q and a for the audiobook um, version of a day of reckoning with the narrator barnaby edwards and um he he was uh, <laughs> i'm forgetting where we would go with this because you started off the by by saying to me oh yes about about the fight scenes and stuff and he was saying how um it was interesting that it's written from the first person perspective and so you know that the, the main character is going to survive um, because he's talking about when he was a younger man, but he said it still manages to seem scary. Like when you're in the fight scene, you still think that he's in jeopardy. And we talked a bit about that and about how obviously the fact that over the book, some of the other characters get either seriously hurt or killed um, does keep you on the edge of your seat because you don't know what's going to happen to all of the people around Hunlaf, even though you know that Hunlaf's going to survive, you know that it ultimately he, he ends up alone um, or alone with other monks but not with his motley crew of warriors uh-huh. that he's got with him. So you don't know what happens to them. Yeah, you keep mentioning motley crew, but we should make it clear yes. that it's not, it's not the band, although... It is actually the band, funnily yeah. enough, yeah. It's... So he does shout at the devil. Yeah, they do. They do that a lot. <laughs> uh, how do you find this series compared to the Bernicia Chronicles? Is it more or less fun to write or just the same? That's an interesting one. I don't know about. I don't know if any writing. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think I find any writing fun. Um, to be perfectly honest, so I don't know. But um, I find it all quite difficult. I think. I think people have this idea that you sit down and and it's just great fun and all the words just flow. I think and it's really it, enjoyable. You must have sometimes over like maybe you've got a fight scene, and they're kind of easy because you don't really have to plan out. What, you know, you just sit down and write it, and it basically writes itself. I think that kind of thing can be fun. No, you know. Yeah, what I mean? yeah. I think, yeah, I think so. I think definitely the action scenes are more fun to write than lots of the other stuff. So the plotting, I, yeah, I, it it's an interesting one. I think they've got their different um, challenges, and the fact that the Benicia Chronicles are written in third person, it's kind of like more of an omniscient perspective point of view, and so you've got multiple. Um, points of view so mm. i can tell the story from different from different perspectives which makes it easier in some ways because if it, if you want to sort of show that there's something going to happen or that somewhere else the king is plotting or whatever you can throw in a, a, at least you know a, there can be two or three different perspectives so you can throw someone you know a different pu- um, point of view in whereas in the hunlaf the real challenge is that fact that it's written in first person and that you can never you can't do that at all so you do actually find yourself I'd say that makes it more difficult to write in some ways, although it's much more immediate in others. Um, but it, it it makes it difficult because you can't do that sort of looking behind the curtain and showing what's happening the other side of of the of a, of a city or something. You have to do it all from the perspective of the of the main character and his recollections. And so every now and again, you do a you, know, you can you can do that thing of like later I heard that um, <laughs> this had happened or whatever. But it, uh-huh. you, you can't do too much of that. So it's. It's, it's. It, I think that that probably poses the most difficulty, and I suppose the other thing that I find challenging with it, although it's much more immediate for the right for the reader, I think from the writer's perspective, doing it first person means that you have to really kind of trust that you're writing from the sort of the truth of the character, that like you're really inside the character's head. That if it feels, I, I don't know, you can't. There's no. There's no. There's no wiggle room for sort of fudging it. You know, the, the reader's going to know that it's not real. If you don't sound like the character, if that makes sense, yeah, I know he's, exactly. got, to con- he's yeah. got to keep his his sort of feeling of being him, you know. So you, you can't, you, there's no, there's no, you can't step out and start just describing things like you can in a in a book in the third person. Where you could describe a battle from like the bird's eye view almost. Um, or you can. Uh, what I was thinking there as you were talking was like you could describe the battle from for talking sake the the baddies side, and it would see yeah. like Bear Brand coming towards them and. How terrifying yes. Bearbrand is. Whereas with Hunlaf, you can't you can't have him describing himself as terrifying. Exactly. You yes. Know, so, so you've got the, that different scene to set which makes it much easier. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's right. I think it's more difficult to write in first person. I think it's much more I think some some readers don't like it, but I think the majority of readers find it more engaging. Um and you can see that from the number of people that say that like the Bernard Cornwells. Yeah. Like they love the Utrecht books and their first person, and also the the um, the Warlord Chronicles um, about the Arthurian stuff. But again, first person, I think it's because people really like that. 
um, that, that way of telling a story. Yeah, it's very visceral, realistic, I suppose. I've got a slightly silly question for you. That's a, that's a surprise. <laughs> You've dropped the alliteration in the titles for this series. Uh, Why? Well, that was intentional as well. Right? That's a, it's a it's pretty good question, actually, it, because, you? well, as I did it for the, for the Serpent Sword and then I did the Cross and the Curse. And then, of course, uh, whatever the next one is, Blood and Blade and um, Fortress of Kin- Fury. Killer of Kings and Fortress of Fury and all. And the reason I started doing it was because of the thinking that this is it's like a um a nod to the um to the alliteration in anglo-saxon poetry and so they use it a lot in that sort of spoken like beowulf style um right. spoken poetry that that, that, that that they're known for you know and so it was really a nod for that uh, to that and then i didn't realize i was going to write so many books and it became <laughs> After a while, pain in the ass. Became, pretty much, yeah, pain in the ass to think of the of the titles. Try to think of a title that's got something to do with the with the story, and it's strong, and it's short enough that it can fit on a cover, and you know all these different things. And it needs to, on top of that, it needs to rhyme. You know, it's hard enough to think of a really good um, title anyway. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so that was it. And when I when I did Wolf of Wessex, which is a standalone, I I wasn't going to alliterate the title. The initial title was different. Actually, and um, and I didn't have I didn't plan to have an alliterative title, so it was only by luck that that ended up becoming an alliterative okay. alliterative title. Can't speak. Um, and then, of course, when I did the, a day of um, a time for swords, I thought, right, this is the moment I need to get away. Yeah. And originally, it was going to be a sort of toying with the idea of having a time for swords, a time for blood, a time for battle, a time for whatever death. Mm-hmm. You know, you could just have any word at the end. Um, that well, in the end, after lots of discussion with the editors, when I came to the second book, we changed our minds about that. But I think um, there's a, I think there's a John Gwynn series that actually does that, uh, right. which I didn't realise at the time. But later, when I was looking and you know we were sort of researching. I thought I'm glad I didn't go that route because I think he's got like a time for, I can't remember what they are now, time for courage or a time for whatever. And I think he's done something very similar. Um, so anyway, in the end, we just went with this. You know, it's a time for swords, a night of flames. A day of reckoning, so they all follow a pattern. So, so obviously, next, all the what's next then? The afternoon, the, the, of the early, eating. the early morning of of headaches. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to <laughs> the, the the afternoon of of hangovers. Of, of, <laughs> the afternoon of blood. I don't know. There, at one point, it was going to be called a dawn of blood. I think that was one of the, the working titles, but it, I don't know. It sounded more like a horror book, though. Yeah. Mm. But it's funny titles. I think actually, funnily enough, um, the the Serpent Sword onwards, uh, the Benicia Chronicles books have been reasonably easy to come up with the titles until like the last couple. Um, and in these last few books that I've done, including the Western that you know we, we mentioned earlier, um, it's been incredibly difficult to come up with good titles that yeah, are solid and stand alone and that don't um, you know stand on their own two feet kind of thing and they're, they're powerful and they don't they're not the oh. same as every other book that's out there because there are other books called a day of reckoning which i wasn't very happy with i didn't want it to be called a day of reckoning actually um right. that was the editor's um push in the end oh, um, quite like i can't, it. I can't yeah i, I mean yeah. I've, I, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it now but i don't like the fact that when you search yeah other people on goodreads sure. you'll find like another you know five or six or whatever well books you say that, but it can definitely help because somebody brought out a book called The Druid recently. Okay. And I only found out because all of a sudden my book, The Druid, started to sell really well for, <laughs> out of the blue. And then I, I turned on my Kindle one day and the advert that showed up was this guy's book called The Druid. And I think yeah. he's actually published by Amazon, so they were really pushing it. Tons of adverts. And as I say, the lock screen on the Kindle was the truth. And that's when I realised people are actually finding my book and buying it. They're just, they're just Googling it. I don't know, know if they were doing it by accident or if they maybe liked the blurb and realised it was a different book or, or what, but it definitely helped. It, for a wee while, for a good month or so, that yeah, book brilliant. sold extra copies, loads. Well, I'll have to, I'll have to hope that like Stephen King brings ah, exactly. out a book called A Day of Reckoning uh-huh. like the week after or something. That's the, that's the. Well, if, that's if the you're the big then, name, yeah. if you're or the big name, the, yeah. whoever's got the same title, they'll find that their book suddenly starts to sell because yours came out. 
Yeah, maybe. That'll be interesting mm. to see if there's there's probably some sort of guy published, you know, ten years ago. I some, suddenly start you know, to sell. It'll be like going, fucking hell, what's happening? Uh-huh. Suddenly suddenly Aye. selling loads of books. All because yeah. of your advertising dollars. Could be. So you're well versed in this period now, obviously. I've already written two previous books. But did you find out anything particularly interesting during the research for a day of reckoning? Yeah, so I'm, each of these books has become challenging as well because of the the research and the fact that moving Hunlef around. I mean, Hunlef's whole the, the sort of description of his life is he, he keeps having these asides in each of the books where he's talking. He goes like, "Oh, I remember one time I was in Baghdad and such and such a thing happened," and and so I haven't plotted out any of those different you know escapades that he's been involved with and so but I, I am sort of sowing the seeds for the fact that he's traveled everywhere and been all over the place and so I'm not a great expert in European history of the 8th century or 9th century um so I did live in Spain for a long time but I didn't I, I've not studied Spanish history really or anything so the fact that he's gone down to Al Andalus in the you know late 8th century it really meant I had to study the whole that whole thing, you know, I didn't really know much about the you know, when the, the Moors had, had first invaded, why they had, you know, how all that had happened. So it was a lot of background reading, bought a few books and um, really interesting time. I mean, the, the, the amount of conflict across the whole of Europe at this time is, is amazing. And how in each country or what we think of as now as a country at those in those times, like in, in France, they have loads of different separate kingdoms in Britain, the same. In in Spain, it was just the same again. You've got this this part of the Al Andalus with the with the the Muslims pushing up from the south, but to the north, there's Visigothic kingdoms and and, and they're fighting against the you know, so they're, they're Christians and they're fighting against the Muslims and so that was interesting from the sort of contextual perspective and some of the interest really interesting things that I found um, especially interesting to me as a as a, a an action adventure writer um, is that the the, the Emir of Cordoba that they end up meeting this guy Al Al Hakam, I think his name is Al Hakam the first or Al Hakam the second. I don't know Al, Al Hakam anyway. The the guy is, and um, he is pretty brutal. He's just come into power, and later on in his, I mean, I sort of there, there's some allusions in the story to his brutality. He does some you know some pretty grim moments as you can expect from this kind of of book. But um, they, they, later on in his um, in his in his life, he put down some rebellion against him, and apparently, he killed all of the. the he, he invited everybody to like a big feast. It's, it's a typical thing that happens in medieval pe- periods. It seems to happen all over the place. Yeah, they invite in everyone to a big feast, well, and then, yeah, sure. well, yeah, because he he he's taken the idea. Actual, of, yeah, yeah, but but yes, yeah, so he invites he invited all these guys that had had some sort of revolt against him. You know, or were, were planning some revolution or something, and he invites them, but he killed them all. Um, but and all of their retainers and retinue that came with them, apparently, possibly five thousand people came to this massive feast. He killed, killed them, them all. all. He killed them all, and then crucified them along and put all their bodies along the Guadalquivir River for like I don't know how many, like a hundred miles or something. So he just had like five thousand corpses all crucified along the the edge of this river up to Cordoba. I thought, wow, that's that's pretty full on. Oh, it's pretty grim. That's a lot of <laughs> crucifixions. It is, but um, it's just when you read those sort of things, you think, what, what sort of? I mean, because even if it's not a hundred percent true, and you know, it's been blown right. out of proportion by people writing the different stories later. I mean, obviously, there's there's going to be a kernel of truth to it, and there's loads of uprisings against him, and loads of different things. He's he just brutally put the heads of of his enemies on spikes outside the gates, you know, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and you just think, what sort of character? would a man like that be really and that's what i find really interesting and just thinking can you actually get inside the head of someone with that much power but also that sort of ruthlessness and brutality that it's difficult to really for me it's difficult to imagine what how how i could you know i can't imagine ever being like that i can't imagine sort of saying you know what you know you've pissed me off so i'm gonna actually i'm gonna kill you everybody you know i'm gonna crucify them all i mean it's just like well how do you get that two six delivery okay okay no problem So how many more books will there be in this series? And have you started the next one yet? 
you have a publication date for it around? So the first <laughs> answer is I don't know. Um, All right, how many okay. books are going to be? So I haven't. I, I I always try to make each book stand alone enough that it you know it ends. So the story effectively yeah. ends um, at the end of this book. So you could you could even pick this book up and read it as a standalone book, but it does fit into the series. But but it you know it definitely has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So if you've not read the other books, you could definitely read this one on its own. Um, and part of that is because I don't really know. I don't I don't want to leave people unsatisfied at the end of a novel. But also, I don't know how many books there are going to be in the series. And with this, of course, the the um, the conceit is that you know you don't know how long Hunlaf is going to remain alive because he's very old and infirm and and he's and he's ill. Though. So all the asides and the modern part of it, or the bit when he's writing it as an old man, not modern, but you know more modern than the, the than the, the flashbacks, mm-hmm. um, are, are him saying how ill he is and how he's in terrible agony and he's got terrible problems with his stomach and stuff. So there's some some horrible thing going on with his health. So yeah, at any stage we can just decide that he doesn't write any more books. You know, <laughs> that's the end. And it's whether I guess how how well they sell and whether you know yeah. I have to continue writing them. But but it does. There is definitely a setup at the end of this book for the story to continue. And I've got sort of vague ideas that you know I could write another few at least. So if if things sell well and and everything goes you know goes well, then I can imagine writing maybe another three at least to sort of do like another trilogy. I guess. Mm. Um, this one does almost feel like the end of a trilogy. Um, there's certain things I wanted to wrap up because I didn't want the story just to continue being the same thread all the way, you know, through or having that sort of. So it's it's got sort of new threads at the end of it that could lead to another another series. Um, but no, I haven't got a date for it. I'm not even contracted for this. I've got one more book after the Western that we've mentioned that I'm contracted for, and that's the Tenth Benicia Chronicles, right. which I'll be starting the end of September, beginning of October. I'm away for most of like in a couple of days I'm going away on holiday, so I'm gonna be away for most of September. Um and then I'll be starting the, the next book. And then that will be coming out, I don't know, the end of next year, because I've got the Westerns coming out, so mid twenty twenty four. So the Bayer brand will be twenty twenty four probably at the end. Um and then then yeah, then then who knows, maybe you know, another one of each. Who knows? Yeah. Well, we know it has to go to Baghdad anyway, because you've told us that. Well, if he goes to all the places, if I write the stories of all the places that he says he's gone, go then there's going to be another 10 books. Because right. okay. it says he's been all sorts of places. He's been on the, the steps of Mongolia. Or he's been to Jerusalem. He's been to Baghdad. He's been so far north that there's no, you know, there's no night in the, in the summer and all stuff like this. So he's been all over the place. I mean, he's... But no night but, in the summer, summer all right? Or no... Right. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, nice like, yeah, so it's like, like, so right far in the north, Pole somewhere. Something? Yeah, yeah, somewhere up there. I don't know, some of the far, farthest north part of Norway or Sweden or somewhere. Glasgow, Glasgow, yeah. So he's mentioned all of these things, but whether he'll write, I mean, he's been to Syria, definitely mentioned that as well. Been to Constantinople, right. Rome. So all of these places he's mentioned that he's been. So if I do a story around all, each of them, then it's going to be a lot a long series. But I doubt that I'll cover all of them in detail. But you never know, I guess. Quite the traveller. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got two main series now. This one, which follows a Christian monk, and the Bernicia Chronicles, which is about a pagan warrior, isn't it? Yes. I'm right and say yeah. I. It's a while since yeah. I read uh, any of them. So do you find it interesting to write from different sides, like? religious sides is that a challenge i'm going to assume you have a side a faith or spiritual path which you prefer in your own life even if you don't really follow a particular religion so if that's the case do you have to be careful not to get preachy that's a kind of odd question for you because you've never once mentioned to me that you have any kind of spiritual feelings or faith or anything like that but i thought everybody usually has something it's interesting because I so I've definitely got a background in Christianity, my like my family background. So my dad was a Baptist minister, All right, um, and and missionary. So so obviously there's the, I was brought up in a Christian household. Um, but when I was and I lived in Spain as I said for a long time, and Spain is very very um, Catholic. Yeah, um, not my so it's different different branch of Christianity, but still very Christian. But it, I do find that lots of that in living in Spain in the eighties and seeing um, how Catholicism, even in the modern world, 
permeated into society and seeing some of the what I would what I I don't know what what could be perceived as superstitions how uh, things permeate society I could I could I think that helped me imagine what the middle ages or early medieval period could be like and how people believe in things more strongly I think basically what I'm trying to say is I think the religious um belief or at least the the the, the visibility of that belief um, in Spain in the 80s and maybe now as well but especially in the 80s when I was there was much stronger than it was in in the UK um, and, I, and probably in other places um, in that we would go you'd go to like a grotto somewhere in the mountains and there'd be small figurines of people's um, limbs made out of wax hanging from some uh, sacred altar where people have prayed for those things well, to the local saint yeah, to try to you know to get healing for their eye or their leg or their hand or whatever. The way you've described it sounds pretty sinister, I have to say. Well, it's really it's so <laughs> yeah, so it is so it's really strange, and I think the the fact that for me coming from a background of a Protestant family, moving to, to to Spain as a teenager and seeing these things, it really impacted me because you you realise how different the outlook was, and and that's only you know. You know, countries that are close together in a modern setting, um, and ostensibly, you know, both 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 Christian countries yeah. and everything. But but the, the the outward belief in certain things, how they you know they would pray. There's all the Virgin Marys everywhere, and they pray to the Virgin Mary to to help for different things. Very different from what we get in the UK now. And but obviously, at the time of the books that we write in the medieval period, everybody was Catholic. There was no Protestantism. It was all. Yep. Roman Catholic. Um, well, if you go back far enough, I suppose it's a bit different. But um, but yeah, in the books that we write, it it's when you're talking about Christianity, it's Catholicism, and it is all of this, uh, all of this stuff about you know the Virgin Mary and all the saints and all of that. So I, I found that very useful and very interesting in terms of being able to kind of put myself in the headspace of medieval people. I sort of kind of extrapolate this modern Spain, I guess, and sort of ramp it up yeah. more um but in terms of my own religious beliefs or anything i mean as i say i was brought up in a christian background but when i was about 14 i said to my parents i don't want to go to church anymore i'm, yeah, I'm done with it <laughs> and they said and they were perfectly fine with it i mean they just said okay fine that's it you've, you've been to church you know so i've got a solid grounding in religion in or at least in the christian religion in terms of I had to you know go to bible school and you know sort of a sunday school and stuff so you know i learned stuff about the bible and a bit of a little bit about things like that so i think that's really useful actually from writing about the medieval period having that sort of grounding in sort of understanding what's actually in the bible and what liturgy is in the church and things i think mm -hmm. those things are interesting because obviously religion permeates everything at that time i mean that's what you're basically referring to the fact that religion really in the early medieval period it just everybody is religious there is no chance for someone to say i'm i'm an atheist or an agnostic really although often our characters are i think so or, or we say our characters i think the characters of modern historical fiction authors um often are these sort of atheists or agnostics and looking sort of down on the the, the pervasive religion of the time and i think that's a way of opening the door to a modern sensibility to look into the past and see well you know what what would it be like to look at at these things that we now think of or lots of people now would think as, as superstitions um and so i I'm, that's a very long answer to what was a short question but i suppose it's such a big thing but yeah i haven't really got any preference um so i suppose writing from hunlaf's perspective it's it's not difficult for me to put myself at least to put the words into his mouth and sort of the understand the way that the that Christian people talk and think about things. Um, I don't necessarily believe those things myself. Um, and and the same, I suppose, goes to <laughs> goes with, with Beobrand in that everybody around him are a pagan or Christian. There's there's more Christians, I guess, than pagans by the time that Beobrand's around, but he still holds to the pagan religion. Um, but only really because he was brought up believing i don't think he's, he's not a hugely devout pagan person and I, I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of his life he ends up converting to, to christianity just because it's the it's what everybody's doing yeah but um, easier 
Yeah, and I think that's probably why lots of people converted yeah, to he's Christianity. Elite, yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's no, a long, I just, I'm sure I've mentioned answer. that before on the podcast that I'd read Stephen Lawhead's King Arthur series actually, uh, and it starts out with a very much pagan. Uh, in Atlantis, I, I'm sure it is, and that sinks, and they come to Britain right. and Avalon, and it kind of progresses from there. Uh, so he draws you in by being all these pagan characters, and then before you know it, he's, he turns really preachy, and the later books are very, very Christian, but I'm, I'm sure it's because he's a Christian, and it just seemed, reading them now, it just seemed like he's really preaching to the reader, uh, and I really, I didn't enjoy the last time I read the series, I had to give up. Uh, whereas when I read it when I was about 13 and I was going to church uh, I, I thought it was a great series but I suppose it just That's depends interesting, yeah. on the, the reader I, I definitely don't I definitely don't try and preach about religion or anything in the books because I, as I say I'm not you know I'm no, not religious but I, think, I, I, I think it seems I think to me I look that a lot it... of uh, like if you go on say like the Bernard Cornwell fan club on Facebook that we're both members of yeah, I think a lot of the people in there uh, think of themselves as heathen or whatever. Um, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, they they yeah. wear the Thor's hammer or whatever round yes, their neck yeah. and, There's and a lot stuff of like that. that. Stuff, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is fair enough, you know. Like, whatever people want to believe in, good, you know. Uh, it's good to have something like that to believe in. But I think you could annoy them very easily if you were suddenly to become preachy and maybe even lose readers if you were to go one way or the other. So it's, it's a kind I think, of, yeah. I think a constant. Thinking about it now, I mean, I've not really consciously thought about it when I was when I've been writing this series. But thinking about thinking about it now, I think maybe one of the things that links both of them together is this questioning of religion, which probably is much more autobiographical because my own background from a you know very devout Christian family, and I, I'm definitely not religious. I don't go to church, and I don't you know I, I don't pray or anything. I mean, I'm not religious at all. I don't practice religion at all, and and I wish to some extent I wish I was religious. Yeah, because I think it would make me it would it would it would it would to some extent soften some of the anxieties that, yeah. that I have. I, you know. Yeah, and, fear um, of death and things like fear that. Fear of death. You yeah, go to heaven. And absolutely. Yeah, I think be less would, worried. It would be quite nice. And uh, so I think Hun, so Hunlaf, you know, he, he gives up. He's he's basically told in the first book, you know, you need to choose. You can't you can't be a warrior like you want to be and be a monk. Yeah. You, know, you need to be one or the other. And I know there are warrior monks and stuff, you know, different types yeah, of history. But at this point, stuff, he's yeah. told he's told by his is the abbot of the of the monastery, you know, you need to make this decision. He chooses to become a warrior at that point in his life. And he really then shies away from the religious side of things. He's still religious, still Christian, he still believes in God, but he really veers away from the sort of devout yeah, path, um, path that thing. he was following. Yeah. yeah, and so he and he's well, he goes off and he does all sorts of things. And he not only kills people in fight, you know, fighting, but he he's a bit of a womanizer and stuff. I mean, he's much more. <laughs> he's he just becomes much more like a warrior. He sort of goes full on. You know, I'm gonna. So he's. I, I guess he's 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 probing the, the the whole thing of like what is you know whether this is the right path and what is my path and what is religion and is it right and he sort of questions. They have lots of philosophical discussions in that first book him and his mentor um another a, a, an older monk called Lefstan and in the Beerbrand books again he's kind of questioning he's questioning the christianity because he has his friend um Kenred the the monk and their friends and they talk about religion sometimes and they question each other's religion you know and the and so there's sort of there is all that sort of element of questioning but i try not to be preachy because well i've nothing to, to preach about really i think if if I if I if I was ever if 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 there's anything ever in any of the books that comes across as a bit more preachy, I'd imagine it would be where I'm 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 thinking you know, I could potentially be making comments on political structures or the way that power is abused and things like that. That would be where I would I think I would show my colours more through a character. Um but you know, hopefully not in a way that becomes too much but i can imagine that could come through sometimes i can i can i can see there's certain scenes or certain conversations in books that i've written whereby one of the characters will espouse views that i've got about those things but... yeah you're very right wing aren't you <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yes of course i am <laughs> yeah. oh so the setting and a day of reckoning early medieval Spain 
It's quite different to the first book, which is mostly around Lindisfarne, as you said. So did you enjoy moving away from writing about England's cold weather and rain and whipping wind over rolling moors to a warmer and perhaps more exotic setting? Yes, I did enjoy that. Yeah, although as I said, it took a lot of um, a lot of extra research. Um, I couldn't just sort of walk out, walk the dog in the rain, and think, "All oh, right, I'll just put this into the next." Yeah, that's scene. ceiling. Yeah. So I had to sort of draw on my memory banks of what it was like living in Spain and the heat, um, uh, because it really does get hot in the summer, and the the, mm-hmm. the, the book is set sort of in the late spring, um, but still, for from a northern European's perspective, down in Andalusia. Um, it, it, you know, it could be up in the 30s easily, um, and so you know they really they really feel the heat, um, and so yeah, so that was nice. Um, not much talk of, of terrible storms and rain, although obviously it does rain in Spain sometimes. But, um, yeah, but mainly even more storms than us. Usually, every yeah, time I've yeah. been, there's been thunderstorms, <laughs> scary yes, ones. Yes, but you get lots of lightning in the summer. The late yeah, summer, you get I mean, lots yeah. of really bad sort of. You know, we don't really get that, not in Scotland anyway. Don't remember the I last do remember. I, I lived in, in in Madrid for for a long time, and I do remember one time walking to a. I think I was walking to a job interview, and I, well, I was. I got the bus, and in between, sort of getting on the off the bus and walking, it was like probably three hundred meters. I had to walk like to a couple of blocks, <laughs> or whatever, to, to the place. It the, the the heavens just opened. It was like a clap of thunder, like it was like out of a movie, you know. And then it was like it was just like walking in a shower, like in a in a you know yeah, in a bath. Yeah. It was like I was so wet. When I got to the place, I had no umbrella or anything with me because I hadn't anticipated did this when I got this team, interview. Did nobody try and sell you an umbrella immediately? Because that's what happened when I was there. <laughs> no, because this wasn't a tourist place. This was like in the middle oh, of Madrid, right, you know. So, so, and and I, but I got to this interview and I was just so wet. And I remember it was so bad that my watch had broken because the water had just gone into. The, I mean, it was just ridiculous. I would look like I just sort of sat in the bath with my clothes on and arrived at this this job interview. It's like, oh, come for the interview. I think I got the job, but I can't remember now. Made an but yes, it does really, it does really rain. But yeah, I did, I did enjoy writing about the thing, and there was lots of the, um, there's mentions of the, uh, the difference in terms of architecture, um, uh, and food and things like that. So I enjoyed bringing those sort of more exotic things into the story, the smells and the the spices and the food and the, the um, the the more um, advanced architecture and technology that they they had. Yeah, because we're kind of so stuck, aren't good. we? Uh, with bread, cheese, and meat is basically the, the a feast, isn't it? To, to yeah. our uh, kings or whatever in this period over yeah. England. So yeah, I'd imagine it's a bit more exciting in Spain. They eat their first. The characters eat their first orange in a day of reckoning. So in none of my books up to this point have any of them eaten an orange. Yeah. Um, before that, and the t- the color, the name orange, I've never mentioned it in any of the books so far. Because the old English didn't have the word orange, they only had the word red. Um, so um, that was interesting. I don't describe it as an orange because they don't know the name of it. Obviously, <laughs> they, they, I describe it, but they don't know they don't know what it is. But they they eat this thing. Oh, this is interesting. Nice. Uh, when we were in Spain the last time, I remember the the heavens opened and there was a, a downpour, and the guys, two guys, ran up trying to sell us umbrellas, but. The funny thing was, I was already holding an umbrella. Me and the wife had umbrellas, and they were still trying to sell us umbrellas. So you you can never have too many umbrellas. (laughs) So, how do you like the cover art for your new book? I think all three are great. Probably even better than the Bernicia Chronicles. Uh, I think they're very atmospheric. Do you get any say in what they'll look like? Yeah, so I really like the um the the cover. The this new one I think is is brilliant. I think all of them are good. Um but I think this one's probably I'm just trying to think. I think this is probably my favorite. Maybe this one's the second one. I think they've got better actually as they've gone on. The yeah. first one has got sort of the cross and the the viking and on the on the front, but the second one has got the ship in the fields which I thought was very atmospheric and a little bit of fire there and then this one yeah with this sort of the setting sun and the the ship and this was basically, I think, I'm trying to remember now, I think this one was basically my brief that I wrote down. I said, you know, I think having a ship with sort of modern, or modern, <laughs> more um, more ornate sort of stone architecture on the coast, having like a sunset looking over the Atlantic and having a Viking ship there. So it was very much 
what I sort of described, and then they right. went off and produced it. And you know, it was a little bit of toing a frame, but not very much at all. This is, I mean, and the architecture. Anyone who's, who sees it will say, "Oh, that architecture is not one hundred percent accurate for Al Andalus in the eighth century or whatever." I mean, yes, I'm aware, but it, as you say, we'll atmospheric. It ticks yeah. a box. It, it 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 sort of it stirs something up in your mind when you see it. You you see, okay, there's Vikings. See, I can see there's a silhouette of a Viking ship. It's, it looks hot. There's the sunset. You know, it looks warm. You can see these sort of ornate buildings. It really, that you know, it it, it shows what scene, yeah. what the book's about. Yeah, it sets the scene. Yeah, yeah. I've just realised actually, it's quite similar to to my the Northern Throne, <laughs> which had ah, the yes. yeah. Barton yeah. Castle with the the ships coming. It's not really that similar, but it's the same kind of idea. Just when you were talking about the brief, uh, it was the same. Although I actually drew it and sent it to the cover designers, yeah. and they kind of just did the exact same thing. But then again, you have uh, a book that's very similar to my new one, The Heathen Horde, with the cover, with the ship on Absolutely. the front we can, of that. We'll, and talk, only, we'll talk about that. Yeah, there's only so many things you can do, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. So your next book that's coming out, is it the Western? Uh, and do you have anything else going on that you want to tell us about before we wrap up? So after, yeah, after this one, it will be the Western, which now has a title. Shall All right, I announce okay. the title? This can be yeah. nobody exclusive. else has heard this, so we can exclusive for the podcast. So the title for the Western, which will be coming out hopefully, I think it's the summer of 2024. Drum roll, please. Dark Frontier. You know, I knew you were going to say that. I think you probably did know that because I think I've told you in the past, but yeah, I also have tried politics. to use... I've tried to use that that title before. Yes, as you say, for Wolf of Wessex. It's been I did I did joke to the publisher that I said um if I write enough books, eventually they'll let me use that title. <laughs> and this one has been ridiculous. It's taken easily two, maybe three months of going to and froing from me saying originally, I'd like to call this one Dark Frontier, and then saying, Oh yeah, okay, and then coming back and saying, No, we've decided we don't like it, and then come up with some more ideas we must have come up with literally well over 50 close to 100 titles um all of which have been rejected for one reason or another um and we've gone back to the original one that i said so in the end i sent them the, the manuscript and they've started reading it and they said you know what we that's... think the title that you wanted from the beginning is okay it's like no shit i thought yeah. it was quite good it's not it actually kind of fits. Your, your title though is it Oh, well, that's an interesting one. Yes, you're right. It was, well, it is my title, but it was suggested to me by um, Robin Young, also known as Erin Young. Yeah, and yeah, that was well, for well, Wilfred Wessex, wasn't it? Yes, and she did suggest it whilst walking to the pub in Wrexham, oh, right. which is now famous, of course, Wrexham, because of the TV thing about the football club. Welcome to Wrexham. You seen that? No. Ryan Reynolds bought the club. Oh, I, uh, yeah. I, I don't know who anyway. he is. Uh, him okay. and McElhenney bought the club. Yeah, Dark Frontier for him, anyway. So anyway, Dark Frontier is the title of the Western, and it will be coming out. It's, rather than a Western, uh, we, we'll talk about it in more detail in due course, but um, yeah, it's more of a, it's a bit of, bit of everything. Victoriana, Western, police, who done it? A bit of everything. So yeah, hopefully that will tick a lot of boxes and people will enjoy it. Yeah, action and adventure, obviously. Looking forward to it. Okay, so we have a couple of questions that we ask all our guests, Matthew. I don't no. know if you're aware, but uh, so... I am aware, but I haven't actually prepared for them, so I'm quickly well, that's thinking good. now. That's okay, good. what have you been watching and reading this week or lately? Right, what have I been watching and reading? I've been watching a few things. Some things on my own and some things with my wife. Um, but I'm just trying to think the latest things that I've been watching with my wife. We've been doing a whole seat, like every season binge from beginning to end of um, the Big Bang Theory, which oh, we had seen before. But um, obviously, I'm a real nerd. You're not. So that's. Uh, I don't know, find I that funny the, at all. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's very much you have to be a specific type of nerdy into certain things to get it or to, to like it you know yeah. anyway so we, we enjoy that and so we've been watching that and um i'm just trying to think what else have we been watching any drama stuff that we've been watching together we have been watching those things. i can't remember now um 
I've been watching um, Only Murders in the Building. We've been watching this uh, Disney Plus um, right. thing with Steve Martin and Martin Short and yeah, and it's and it's very good comedy again, um, amusing. On my own, I've been watching Yellowstone. I'm binge watching the series of Yellowstone. I've watched all the prequels first. They had nine, 1923 and 1883. I'm now watching the um, the actual main series, the Kevin Costner one. I'm on season four. It's incredibly violent and incredibly ridiculous, uh, but I mean, and, and totally unbelievable. But is very compelling and binge worthy. And you can almost just say switch off your mind. It's very well filmed. Obviously, production values are huge. It's all just like good looking people riding around on horses and killing each other and every now and again having sex. Sounds exciting. So, yeah, perfect. I mean, the, the, the visuals are incredible. I mean, the mountains of Montana and all of the, you know, I don't know where it is filmed, but it's, it's supposedly set in Montana. And it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful. And what channels this on? Because this gets mentioned all the time on Rock Paper so it's, People watch it. It's on, so in the UK, um, you can get it on Paramount Plus if you've right, got Paramount Plus. And if anyone who's listening has got Sky, if you've got a Sky Q box, you can get Paramount Plus included for free in that. Um, if you haven't got Paramount Plus, you can get it through Amazon and stuff. But um, it's now just started airing on Channel 5. I think, so. I think oh, season right, one. Okay. Right. Is now airing on Channel Five, but I think literally they're like up to the third or fourth episode or something. So it's right. just just started. Okay. So Channel Five is a terrestrial TV for anyone listening outside of the UK. So anyone can access that. And reading. So, what have I been reading? Um, interesting. I'm just trying to think. What have I been reading? The last book I finished was a book which we're going to talk about in a podcast very soon which is A Savage Moon by Theodore Brunn. So he sent me an early copy of that, an arc of that, an advanced reader copy. And it's the fourth, I believe, in his series, um, which is, again, sort of pre-Viking, sort of viking Norse yeah. guy. Very, It's got real similarities with, um, as we talk about with Theodore Brunn, when we get him on the podcast, uh, people will hear, there are similarities between Hunlaf's story and and... And his characters, they go to similar places and you know travel around and some of the same inspirations behind it. But yeah, it's great. Lots of um savage battles and lust and betrayal and love and intrigue and all that you could expect from a good action historical like thriller. A romp. Yeah. Okay, last question. What have you been listening to? And did you listen to music when you were writing a day of reckoning? Well, of course, I listened to music when I was listening when I was writing um, a Day of Reckoning. I can't remember what music I listened to, um, but yes, I did listen to stuff. I probably listened to all the usual suspects. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. The, yeah, I think I, I tried to. I, I can't remember now, but I'm pretty sure that I found a, a, a few things that had vaguely Moroccan arabesque sort of stuff. So some of the gladiator themes has got sort of bits there when they're sort of in the the desert scenes early on where they've got some of that. And I think there's um, the music from kingdom of heaven. I think things like that, which kind of conjured up certain, uh, you know, feeling or, or, or an atmosphere of the, the, the middle East, you know, to give me a bit of that sort of Al Andalus flavor. Yeah. Um, and in terms of music that I've been listening to recently, new music, um, the latest um, Greta Van Fleet had a new album out. Well, are they any good? Ago. I quite like them, but although I find that I only really like a few of the songs. It, I find, in, in all honesty, I like it when I'm listening to it. Right. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's Stargazer, I think it is, the, the new album. Um, it's a rip off a rainbow, is it? No, they know that. Is it Stargazer or Starcatcher? It's something like that. Let me just right. open it up and, and find out the title because I feel like I don't want to give the wrong one. Anyway, yeah, my, I have been listening to um, Ronnie James Dio doing the star gazer thing so i could have just got that model up i get my eyes on judas priest i don't know it just sounds like a familiar familiar title well anyway when i'm listening to the album it's very very well made um and i think you know this is great i'm enjoying this but it doesn't compel me to go back and listen to it again whereas their very first yeah star catcher sorry is there um the album 
Star ca- Starcatcher, but their their first stuff, the anthem of the peaceful army and stuff mm. that they did. Um, I find myself drawn to go back and listen to those songs. The more derivative, I think, of um, Led, of Led Zeppelin, and I really Rush like as them, well. But, I think, yeah, this this new stuff is they've gone a little bit more hippy dippy with it, and um, mm. still incredibly great vocals and really well done and everything. So it's still very listenable, but yeah, I don't know if it's quite as compelling it doesn't grab me by the throat yeah i think i would much. rather just listen to led zeppelin and rush really but if yeah you, if i think port, they, i think they like fairport convention as well they covered one of I their think, songs it was quite a good they cover. Like it. yeah i think they like all of that sort of 60s yeah. uh, early 70s stuff and that they're um yeah i mean they sound great it's just nice to hear a modern young band stuff, that's yeah. trying to do what it what is sort of classic rock but also very very talented i mean the lead singer i I was, it's interesting talking to different musicians over the years i've realized that certain people listen to bands in a very different way and if you're a guitarist you tend to listen to guitar driven stuff and you kind of i think some guitarists will just almost not hear the vocals they're only listening <laughs> to the guitar and in my case as a vocalist you know when i've been in bands and stuff and as a singer i i tend to really focus on bands that have great lead vocals and the the, the singer's vocals are amazing and really, my my sort of my my yardstick of measuring whether a band is is good, I think, to some extent, is whether the vocalist is better than me. And yeah. he can, like, you know, he's he definitely range. is. I mean, yeah. He's like he can, you know, it's like wow, this guy can really, really sing. You know, obviously, there's loads and loads of bands that got better singer that you know can sing better than me. But sometimes <laughs> I hear a rock band, I think, oh, I can sing better than that. You know, he's, it kind of, I don't know. It's, no, I know it what you mean. Me I, bit, I, you know. I feel like that with Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. That there was just something about the way his albums were produced and the way he sings. That I just can't get into him. But his guitar's great. Oh, he's, oh well, he was a pioneer, definitely uh, yeah. genius. Um, okay, so I think that's it for today's episode. Eh? We hope you've so. enjoyed well, it. <laughs> I've enjoyed it very much. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've got another one to record now. You've um. You've you've done more talking than usual. Yeah, and I was I even going to do the outro as well. Yeah, okay. Go for it. That's it for today's episode. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please take a moment to leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on and don't forget to subscribe. Let us know if you have any questions or things you'd like us to cover in future episodes. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash rockpaperswords and we're also on X at rock underscore swords. You can find out more about our books on matthewharfey.com and stephenamackay.com. The theme music is written and performed and copyrighted by us. Until next time on Rock, Paper, Swords, it's goodbye from me, Matthew... Oh, no, Stephen Mackay. (laughs) And it's goodbye from me, Stephen Mackay... No, Matthew (laughs) Harfey. That's what you get for reading off a script. And remember, whatever action and adventure you have going on in your life, be kind. Stay safe. And happy reading. Maybe that's enough. Ah! It's all over me. It's like the money shop. <laughs>